sessions talking about okay. yeah so let us see we're going to spend a few weeks or a few sessions talking about toxicology right so toxicology is a study of toxins and how they affect our body all right the problem with toxicology patients and if you've worked in any emergency department any emergency setting you know what happens families paramedics come in and the history that you get is that this person took some big amount of something they don't know what they're not 100 percent sure they don't even know what time and here you have this patient that's floppy falling all across the place all right so that's where it becomes tricky and that's where most people struggle with toxicology all right so what we're going to do today number one the audit is just a part of it right so we, we audited the poisonings and things like that in there just to see how we were doing but that's not the important thing actually what the audit covers is your approach yeah no stress do whatever you need to it's okay all right so um yeah so the, the question is, what do you do when you have these patients and how do you approach them? So that's what the audit will talk about. And then we'll get towards the, um, what you will call it, the actual management of these patients under different circumstances. Morning, morning, come, come sit. All right, so the, we had uh, eight patients. We presented them along three different, uh, seven different criteria. Uh, and those are the criteria that we're gonna talk about. The criteria basically being, what do you do when this patient first walks in? So we're talking about toxicology, all right? Poisoning, okay. So the first and foremost thing, and these are like universal guidelines for any patient, but just to emphasize them, okay? So you do the primary resuscitation. It's no use trying to get rid of a toxin in a patient that's not breathing, doesn't have an airway, doesn't have a pulse, okay? So I know it sounds arbitrary, but a lot of people do forget about it, all right? So that CAB component has to be completed first before you do anything else, right? Uh, okay, this is not important at all. The second thing is the risk assessment, okay? Now, the risk assessment follows a few things. What was taken? And very often, we don't have an answer. Or we get too much information. In other words, every tablet that's ever been in the house is brought to us, you know? And they say, here, figure it out, you know? And there's 20 things lying in front of you, and you don't know which one how much was taken, also very difficult. Uh, we got the tablets two days ago. No, no, it was two weeks ago. No, no, this one was picked up six months ago, but what about this one? So you don't even know how much was taken at the end of the day, right? But ideally you should try. Sometimes you do get a good idea, you know? Uh, patient got isonized at the beginning of the month, half the bottle is empty. So you got an idea that there's 15 left. You know, you do get those, there's no doubt, you know? Time since ingestion, extremely important, all right? Within one hour, you can, uh, what you call, decompress the stomach, activate a charcoal, you can do a lot to try and eliminate the toxin, even up to four hours. Past four hours, eh, it doesn't really work that well. But in patients that we've used it up to four hours, it hasn't had much of, it's, it's had quite a big effect, right? And then of course, the clinical features and progress also help. So when you say clinical features and progress, what are you looking for? Level of consciousness, seizures, right? weakness, malaise, ab abnormal behavior. You're trying to get an idea of what could be going on. Now, actually, I don't want to mention all because those are all the, the, the syndromes we'll talk about later, right? to try and get an idea of what happens. And also to find out how quickly did it happen. So for example, the patient started seizing. The patient started seizing one and a half hours after taking it, five minutes after taking it. It gives you an idea of the amount that may have been taken as well, all right? Patient collapsed immediately, patient became comatose after three hours. It gives you an idea of how much was taken or the volatility of the substance that was taken as well, all right? And then of course you add things such as weight, patients who are larger, it takes longer for them to in, uh, digest the actual thing uh, because the gastric uh, emptying is delayed, all right? And then other comorbidities, all right? So an asthmatic that overdoses on a tenolol, is in trouble, agreed. A hypertensive that died, died, or overdoses on a tricyclic antidepressant, which causes hypertension and tachycardia is in trouble. So you need to know about those types of things, all right? And then specifically in pa pediatric patients, all right? Assume that the time of ingestion was recent. The reason why I say that children tend to react to toxins quickly, you've got kids, you've got kids. 
when are you most worried? When they're quiet, isn't it? Not when they're making noise. When they're making noise, it's fine. We don't care. But when they stop making noise, one of two things, either something is breaking or they are getting broken. One of the two, all right? So when children take these things, we tend to run and get to them quite quickly, all right? You assume that everything has been taken. In other words, that's your starting point. You don't try and count out as for adults. You just assume if there's a packet of Panado, the whole packet was gone. If there was a bottle of this, the entire bottle is gone. All right. You don't assume spillage. You don't do... The reason being you, you rather over-treat a pediatric patient than under-treat a pediatric patient because their ability to recover is better and your over-treatment won't cause much of a problem. All right. If more than one child is involved, assume that each has taken the maximum amount. Again, it's the principle of overtreatment, okay, for pediatrics, remember that, all right? And then the other question, is this non-accidental, all right? It doesn't happen too often, but you do get Munchausen's by proxy syndrome and Munchausen syndrome where children are being uh, given uh, toxins to create symptoms so that the parent or the caregiver is shown sympathy. Shame, you have to look after a sick child. You have to, there's things like that. But we don't see it that often. And when it does happen, it becomes more psychiatric after that. But it's just something to put in there, all right? So that, that's one of the other things that you need to look at. Uh, let's go. Where, where were we? I hate this read more. Okay. Uh, supportive care, all right? So what is supportive care? IV lines nasogastric tubes, catheters, things like that, right? Keeping the patient's head slightly elevated, checking blood sugars re regularly and maintaining a comfortable temperature. It's basic stuff. Those are things that you should do, all right? So your IV lines, granted. Nasogastric tube depends on the fightiness of the patient as well. If some of them are very fighty and may vomit and aspirate, I'd say stay away from it. Catheter is a must, right? You should try and get the catheter in. The good part is most of the patients are quite sedated already with the majority of the things that they will take. So getting in NGTs and catheters shouldn't be much of a problem. You keep the head slightly elevated just to decrease intracranial pressure. Basically, you're keeping them in the neuroprotective stance, all right? Now, I'm hoping it's the practice bell. Let me check. Is it the real thing? I'm just practicing. Sorry, we're waiting to check if we really have a recess on what's going on. It'd be nice if I had adverts to show, but I don't. Uh... <laughs> She's not coming back. Let me just have a quick look as well. Sorry. Okay. All right. Then let's carry on. Okay. So it was just the practice plan. Okay. All right. Uh, and then you check HGT regularly simply because some of the toxins, especially in overdose of uh, certain of the antipsychiatric medications, certain of the, uh, what you call, of course, your diabetic medications, things like that, uh, the nephrotoxic uh, medications can all cause hypoglycemia very quickly, all right? And temperature, simply we'll get to that in a little while, all right? So investigations. So what are your investigations? All your initial investigations are all baseline bloods, all right? So everything that you would consider baseline blood needs to be done. To that, you add ABG, all right? You add clotting profiles, right? Because a lot of the drugs interfere with your sodium, potassium, then they have uh, what you call your ability to clot paracetamol levels if you don't know what was taken. So if you don't know what was taken, unless you can put the patient into a particular set of symptoms, which we'll discuss over the next few weeks, but if you don't know for sure, always add paracetamol, okay? Chest and abdominal x-rays should be done as well, okay? Certain drugs actually show up on x-ray. For example, your iron tablets taken in large quantities actually show up, so you can see them, all right? And then decontamination. So decontamination, there's a few, we'll get into it, but activated charcoal can be used, sodium bicarbonate can be used. Uh, so in three patients, we had it doesn't done, but that's not such a major thing, all right? The only reason that we try and, uh, Call it, provide any sort of decontaminations that it reduces the amount of uh, toxin available to cause damage, basically. 
you know. So you're trying to remove it. So it, the damage from 50 panados and you decontaminate 30 out of those has now become damage from 20 panados. You get what I mean? So you're reducing the amount of damage that can be caused. So that's, uh, and it does decrease hospital stay, improves outcomes, things like that. But sometimes even with giving all of these things, patients have taken huge amounts, you know. And then, uh, well, the specific antidotes we'll get into just now, right? But was specific antidote for identified uh, poison or toxin given is an important thing. And uh, especially when the patient fits into what we call a toxidrome, which we'll talk, in to, uh, talk about this now, right? Uh, so the use of a specific antidote reverses the pathological effects of the poison in question. All right, so this can range from sodium bicarbonate to paradoxin to atropine, there's so many, all right? So you have to uh, check those out and see, all right? Let me see, was there anything else? Ah, yes, disposition. So you need to know where your patient's going to go after that high care or ICU, all right? The thing is, if you send a very unstable patient into a high care where they can't be monitored properly, these patients tend to deteriorate very quickly or they take turns for the worse within a few seconds because it depends on absorptions. So, and, and absorptions depend on a lot of things as well, gastric emptying, previous meals, body habitus. There's a lot of things that can affect different toxins. So what may happen is you have a patient who's relatively stable and then suddenly starts absorbing everything and goes into cardiac arrest, you know? And if you don't have somebody keeping an eye on that patient or the facilities to keep an eye on that patient, you may well lose them. You know? So ICU is always preferred. The ideal is that the patient goes from an a &E to an ICU once they've done well in ICU for 24 hours, then they get moved to a high care and then they get moved to a normal bed. You know? That's how it should be. It doesn't always work like that, but that's how it should be. Okay, uh, the tox protocols I'll give to you guys just now. Uh, let's just try and close this thing up. All right, and see if it will bring up the other one. Okay. Uh, ah. Okay, so let me try and share the other one now. Uh, now we get into the main one. Right? So this uh, this is a long presentation. Just warning you now, all right? So we can't do all of it. So for today, we're going to concentrate on one thing. What do you think it is? Take a guess. Which drug? Which poison do we all hate? Because so many of them come. Huh? No, but it's not. Yes, again, no first phase. Again, no first phase. Again, no first phase. I hear all the time. It's like somebody standing outside the hospital insecticide, like, hey, you want a few days off? Take this. <laughs> you'll get to visit the ICU. You'll get to visit. <laughs> I care. Have you ever been intubated? Try it now. <laughs> Here, use this. We almost all the good bits. Now is all the boring. Okay. Uh, <laughs> can you see? Let me put it on. Let me see. All right. So, like I said, this uh, presentation it's extremely long. So we're going to break it up into little parts, right? So that people can learn it properly. Okay. So uh, let's start. So it's an approach to an unconscious poison patient, right? Approach the poison patient with a poor collateral history and then classification of the poison patient, right? So for those who came late, generally, when you get a poison patient, there's a few things that happen. Number one, nobody knows what was taken. Nobody knows how much of what was taken. Generally, you tend to get too much of information that everything that's in the house is brought, you know? from granny's metformin to kids gummy bites, everything gets pulled along and you don't know how much of each one has been taken. And your job now is to try and figure out where does this patient fit so I know how to treat them, okay? Because it is important that we try and treat these patients as quickly as possible. Now toxicology in itself, if you were to become an emergency physician, in year four, year five, you are given the option, because you are given the option of doing a six-month toxicology uh, like diploma, like 
put it that way, where you go and work at the poison center and you basically get this as an extra thing, you know, and then thereafter you can further specialize in toxicology as a toxicologist. And there's only two in South Africa, all right? Yeah, there's only two. And if you want to meet them, it's no problem. Give them a call. They fly to you in their private jet and then they fly back home. So something to think about. Huh? All right. <laughs> no chartering for them. Just, I have to go. All right. And the thing is, if, if, if we had like three months, you know, of daily sessions, we'd be able to go through every toxin. But the truth is that even working in a busy emergency department, you don't need to know every toxin. We're going to put the video up later, don't worry. Oh, okay. She joins us sometimes, but anyway. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll cover some individual toxins, but more we're going to talk about toxic drones, all right? So what are your best tools in an unresponsive poison patient? Now, a responsive patient is fine. How much did you take? When did you take it? What did you take? Very good. No problem. And majority will answer, uh, I took some panado. Uh, I took some of my antidepressants. I took some of my ARVs. And when you look at most of them, they're going to be fine. They took a moxel, a whole pack, which at worst is going to give them a bit of a gastric you know, problem. That's about it. So, but we're talking about those now where you can see this shit is going to hit the fan. This person is bad, all right? So your eyes. What do you think you're going to look for in your eyes? Based on what we were talking about? Pupils, right? So they start from the inside out. So look at the pupils themselves, right? Are they constricted? Are they dilated? Then you look at the sclera. Are they dry? Are they wet? Are they opened or are they closed? All right, as part of the GCS, okay? Your hands, you touch the patient, not inappropriately. It's not a time to have fun, okay? What I mean is, is the patient warm? Is the patient cool? Is the patient dry? Is the patient wet? These are the criteria that you're looking for, okay? Your blood analysis, of course, your ABG, your glucose, and then you do your ECG. Now, I haven't spent too much time on ECGs in this particular set thing, but I'll, I'll add them on towards the end, right? So you'll see how different ECGs look in different poisonings, okay? But your eyes and your hands are the most important things when you initially get this patient, because in ABG, ECG is gonna take a few minutes, all right? Come in. Yes. Uh, would somebody be able to and help Dr. Moses? Thanks. Yeah, thanks. If she is struggling, just call us. We'll come. All right. All right. So I've been talking about toxidromes. So what is a toxidrome? A toxidrome is a set of clinical features consistent with a particular drug class or toxin. To put it in simple words, a flu is characterized by a runny nose, sore throat, blockage of the ears, headaches, fever, and cough. Agreed? So if somebody comes to you with a swollen left ankle, your diagnosis is not flu. Do you get what I'm saying? So it's the same thing with toxins. So by examining your patient, you can place them into a toxidrome. So we're going to look at one toxidrome, common toxidrome. And that toxidrome is uh, cholinergic and anticholinergic substances. We're not going to concentrate too much on the other one, but that's the first one that we're going to concentrate on. Hey, where is this? Right. Now, uh, let me just do something here. Ah, it's not allowing me to change it. Okay. Ah, I still see it. Okay, it doesn't help. All right. Uh, but basically, what I wanted to do was concentrate on organophosphates and then compare them, all right, to the other side. So what is the toxic drum of organophosphates or insecticides? Number one, small pupils. Not just small, but pinpoint, all right? What do organophosphates do? Organophosphates go in. They attack your cholinesterase receptors, and they basically cause, how may I put it? They are competitive antagonists. So they go in there, they remove uh, the cholinesterase, they start stimulating it. And then they cause what you call muscarinic 
and nicotinic effects. Okay, nice thing to read about. Okay, but for now, we're just going to concentrate on what exactly it gives you. So small pupils, pinpoint pupils, hypersalivation. So these people drooling all over the place, all right? Lacrimation, so they're crying. They are diaphoretic, so they are sweating. They are urinating. They are defecating, okay? Uncontrollably. They are cold. They are bradycardic. And they have an altered mental state, okay? So what do you see in the patient's eyes? Small pupils that are wet, all right? It's raining basically from there, all right? When you touch them, they are cold, but they are moist. So clear me almost, okay? What can you smell? Feces, urine, all right? The reason why I mention this is because even tomorrow, you and you should be able to tell me this is an organophosphate poison because it's so classical. Pinpoint pupils, lacrimation, diaphoresis, along with urine, fecal incontinence, um, what you call bradycardia and hypothermia, all right? And an altered mental state, all right? Let me just clear all of that. Now, the nice part about toxidromes is you see we have cholinergic and anticholinergic, all right? Now, I can't block this off, but if I could, I would just block that off like that, you know? We are watching it on one screen, all right? But just to show you the differences and how if you learn one, you can immediately learn the other. So let's imagine for one second that that side is blocked. And you had never heard of anticholinergic overdose. So you've got cholinergic that you've just learned. So all of you look at me. If cholinergic has small pupils, anticholinergic has what? Dilated pupils. If cholinergic has hypersalivation, anticholinergic has? And you can look, you can pretend, you can, all right? Dry mucous membranes, all right? The cholinergic has lacrimation, wet eyes. So you expect the anticholinergic to have dry eyes. All right. The cholinergic has wet skin. Anticholinergic has dry skin. Okay. The cholinergic is peeing and pooing all over the place. Anticholinergic can't pee or poo for the life of them. Okay. Uh, cholinergic is hypothermic. Anticholinergic is hyperthermic. Okay, cholinergic is bradycardic, anticholinergic is tachycardic. Very good. The only thing in common is the altered mental state. Just like that, you've learned about five or six drugs. All right. So, anticholinergic is atropine tricyclic antidepressants. You guys heard of amitriptyline? Uh, you know what's the other name for amitriptyline? Hospital Smarties, because that's how it's dished out. <laughs> Everybody gets amitriptyline. You can't sleep, amitriptyline. You're feeling down, amitriptyline. Your pain medication is not working, amitriptyline. <laughs> amitriptyline is giving you side effects. Yes, I'm amitriptyline. Yeah. <laughs> and so people get amitriptyline in hospital and in most hospitals. <laughs> so these are the two classes that you get, all right? So I just want to show you a little thing about it. So. If you have, uh, if you really are interested, go on to clossandbruce.com, all right? They have all of these uh, for all the different ones. I love to look at this website, just to have a laugh to, not even to learn, all right? So this is a cholinergic syndrome, diarrhea, urination, bradycardia, all right? You see, they show you the insecticide, frotting at the mouth, salivation, bronchorrhea, pinpoint pupils, meiosis, sweating, crying, running nose, vomiting, all right? So then the other one, uh, the, the, well, this is the, the, the thing that they use, hot as a desert, blind as a bat, mad as a hatter, dry as a bone, red as a beet, all right? We have a nicer one, all right? Uh, which is not as politically correct. Uh, it's called uh, can't see, can't pee, can't sit, can't shit. All right, so that's how you remember this one, all right? So this one, can't see, can't pee, can't sit, can't shit, because that's exactly what they are doing, all right? So they present as, an, as a psychotic patient. They come in there, they are psychotic. For all in all means, they are psychotic. Until you go next to the patient and you touch them and they are hot. And then you look in their eyes and they are dilated. And then you measure their heart rate, like 160, 170. And then you realize something has gone wrong. This patient is absolutely flushed at the same time. So that's how you tell the difference between the two, all right? Now, what we're gonna concentrate on next is 
how do you treat it, right? Because like I say, if you remember one, you can remember the other one, it's very easy. Right? And we're actually gonna stop now because of the management of organophosphates. I'm gonna talk about uh, tricyclics in the next one, okay? So what do we use? Atropine, all right? Why do we use atropine? Atropine you saw was on the side of uh, poisons as well, but it's a poison when taken on its own. But used in the context of uh, cholinergics, it's the antidote, right? So there's a few things that it does. Number one, it is also a competitive antagonist to um, what you call it, the organophosphate or carbamate, whatever it is. So it also dislodges it from the cholinesterase uh, receptor and it goes in there and it starts doing its work as well, right? So they're both battling against one all the time. So <clears throat> generally, you will give atropine when there is significant bradycardia. If you have enough, use it for every patient. But atropine, it has been in short supply over the last few years. So we try and be a bit conservative with it, or we let it be used in ICU, unless it's a very obvious bladder. Okay. There are other ways to try secretions, for example. All right. The question is how much? Because it's difficult. Your patient's dying now. How many times now? Even to Google and try and work out. So you get your calculator out. Easiest way to remember how much of atropine to give. Guess your weight. I'm not going to do it for the ladies. Let's guess for Dr. Glam. No, because they'll hit me afterwards if I guess even <laughs> half a kilo wrong. So let's say Dr. Glamini is 70 kilos. All right, so Dr. Glamini. Okay, but I'm just saying, let's say, for example, you're 70 kilos. All right, I guessed him at looking at you. All right, so I guessed him at you are 70 kilos. For each 10 kilos of yours, I'm going to give one M of 0 0.5 milligrams atropine. So that means I need seven amps for you. I guesstimate for Dr. Sibeko. Dr. Sibeko, let's put at 80 kilos. You're slightly larger. All right. So we're going to give you eight amps. All right. Then you come to Dr. Muhammad. Now you've got, oh God, 12 amps, 13 amps, 14 amps. You get what I mean? But what I'm saying is you can work it out. And it's the same for kids. All right. Same for kids. So let's say, for example, Dr. Lamini, we're going to give him seven amps. All right. We're giving one vial per 10 kilos. So a 50 kilo patient, five grams. 60 kilo patient, six vials. That, that, that easy, all right? And we give up to 10 vials max, right? So five grams max as a bolus, right? That's how we give it in. So that's the initial treatment that we give, all right? Oops. Okay. Now, once you've given that in, your patient should start showing a response. And you can re bolus them after about 10 minutes, okay? You've re bolus them, you've done everything, but now you need to get them ready for ICU. So that exact amount that you worked out, be it five vials, seven vials, 10 vials, you place it in one liter of any fingers, normal saline, avoid the glucoses, but any one of those, and you run it in over and out. Okay. So that will keep your patient atropinized, what it says atropinized. The sad part is you will not see much of a difference in the emergency department, except for the heart rate. So the heart rate will start to improve. The secretions will get a little bit better, but everything else will more or less be the same. The pupils are going to be there, the urine is going to be flying out, everything's going to be happening, right? So you're not going to see much of a difference. These patients often need 24, 48 hours of atropine going in before they come out, okay? One of the other catches, remember you're going to be intubating these patients a lot of the time. There's a lot of secretions coming out of that lung. So those patients need to be suctioned very often. Okay, so these are just a few things that you need to know with organophosphate poison. Now, some of you will read about a drug called pralidoxine or PAM2 inhibitors, all right? These were developed to counteract organophosphates very quickly. They would go in, immediately remove the organophosphate out and sit in the receptor. The problem is organophosphates, pure organophosphates have fallen out of favor. So there's another drug called a carbamide that it does the same job and, it has, and it's cheaper. So it's been placed into insecticides. And the problem is pralidoxime has no effect on that. So you'll find pralidoxime not really being used because if you study this, you, but there is a drug, we should be keeping this drug everywhere. The reason why we don't keep it is because when we fail with everything else, we then use pralidoxime on the off chance that there is some true organophosphate in that so that it can try and remove it as well. Okay, now I want you just to have a look. We are giving like, for example, one vial per 10 kilos. So we're giving like five grams max, okay? 
and we may be giving another five grams and we're giving another five over an hour. So we might give like 15 grams over one hour as a big dose for us. There are formulations of atropine that have 250 grams per vial that are used to try and treat some of these patients. Or there's the 15 gram per vial, per vial. So there's huge amounts of atropine that are sometimes used to treat these patients because of the amount of organophosphate that they have taken. If you do want to off somebody, give them organophosphate. I'm telling you, nobody will catch up, really. Just keep them away from healthcare for like a day, you know, give them some organophosphate, job done. You, know? you can even be the one who discovers the body. You know, the, <laughs> who would do this? You know, and uh, <laughs> I am going to end up in jail on this day. <laughs> Please do not kill people. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I hope you guys understood organophosphates. All right. So from an emergency department point of view, it's very easy. Identify. Identify by pupils, running eyes, cold skin that's sweaty, right? Slow heart rate. Skin that's cold but moist. Urine, feces. Okay. That's how you remember it. Vomiting sometimes, but not that much. How do you treat? Get the weight, all right? Guesstimate, you don't need to be exact. 50 kilos, I'm giving five vials. 70 kilos, I'm giving seven vials. Bolus, watch your heart rate, it will start to increase. Patient starts to go down again. Bolus them again after five to 10 minutes. Take that dose, five, seven, eight vials in one liter to run over one hour. By that time, you get hold of the physician. They must have the ICU bed ready and they must be able to take the patient across but you have saved this patient, okay? All right, the worst thing to do is now phone the poison center. I've got a patient who's not doing too well. I don't know what they took. Oh, their heart rate's 20. Oh no, it's okay, they stopped breathing. I'll call you back. Do you get what I mean? That's the worst thing to do. These are things that you are expected to, all right? You phone the poison center for, and somebody drank a liter of sheep to, none of us know what to do, don't worry. Okay, you all don't know what to do. I mean, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I've had to phone them many times, so I've learned what to do. <laughs> but don't worry, we're going to tackle more and more topics over the next week. Right? And I'm also going to introduce you to some of the ECGs. So next week, we're going to cover the tricyclics and specifically look at an ECG of a tricyclic because tricyclics can mimic one or two others. And your ECG can actually tell them. Okay, hope you all enjoyed that. Hope it was okay. For the people on Zoom, I hope you all enjoyed it as well. And we'll post it a little bit later. Okay, bye-bye.